so this morning, um, I just want to thank everybody for being here and for now being woken up with the rock star start, <laughs> the air guitar moment. Um, <clears throat> really pleased to be here today to share with you um, an access that's very new to Cicada and that's really under construction. Um, and so what we're really hoping is that um, the discussions this morning and uh, in the breakout sessions will help us to think further um, how to, st how to um, bring together the themes in this um, axis and where the synergies are amongst the different partners that are here and um, academics and, and indigenous peoples. My work is mostly in the south, um, in Colombia, does link north and south. Um, but um, so is it, I'm going to be giving you an overview. I'll touch a little bit on some of the work that I do, but mostly that was already discussed in the Latin American conference that we held in Fusagasuga in October. So I um, really want to um, give the floor over to this regional area today. So our theme area is uh, indigenous rights, indigenous laws, and interlegality. And, um, it began with a, a, just a realization that these are issues that have really cut across all the different uh, working areas of the of, uh, CICADA, but that um, maybe uh, really concerted um, um, teasing out and thinking about um, how um, these issues interact would be beneficial, just a, a sort of standalone theme area that cross cuts, but that merits some deeper thought about how um, indigenous law encounters other laws and what the effects are on indigenous law and on uh, those other legal systems um, with which it interacts. So it was first uh, the gap, or I should say the opportunity to work on this was identified at the Windaki Global Conference in August of 2016. And then at the leadership conference in June here in Montreal, we sort of got the go-ahead. We presented the idea and got the go-ahead that, yes, this is an axis that it merits some more thinking as a separate axis. And then finally, we started engaging in some of these issues um, through small group discussions in the uh, Latin American regional meeting. And, um, and th there, there was real interest, too, in continuing this discussion and, and seeing where there are synergies among partners. So mostly it's been a, an America's, as I guess, um, scope um, to date. I'm actually am not sure what happened in Africa, if this was a theme that was also um, discussed at the regional conference there as a separate axis. It wasn't, okay. So, so far it's sort of been an America's um, discussion. So um, we've kind of identified these, these uh, three areas like this. Um, indigenous rights are the fundamental rights that are um, enshrined in international human rights frameworks, recognized nationally um, through state law and further defined in international and national jurisprudence. The fundamental rights, but how they're then taken up um, through state law. And then indigenous law, which we see really is um, uh, one at the center of the work that we're doing and, and the focus. Um, and in other places, they, in, where I work, for example, they call it derecho propio. They call it indigenous law, but they call it our own law. Right, Maybe I should go up to the pedal stall. I just. just I think yeah. Or further like this? Yeah. Okay. Sorry? Like that? Stay back. Stay back. Stay back. Stay back. Like back, back. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I can give myself like this. <laughs> it's just hard to stand in front of a column, you know, um, from there. But I realize they still am from down here. But anyway. <laughs> It's okay, I'm just going to use this. Did you manage to turn that off? I did, I turned it off, so I hope everything works out well now. Um, so, hello again. <laughs> Um, so, yes, yeah, so um, indigenous law is really at the center of um, our, our thinking and certainly the partners that we work with, this is uh, the starting point uh, of the discussion. 
um, where I work they call it gobierno propio uh, or derecho propio, it goes hand in hand with self-government, indigenous laws integral. Um, and um, this is autonomous decision making and rules, um, has, doesn't uh, um, connect necessarily with the state um, law, but it, 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 um, from its own conception, but it interacts with um, the state system and is either recognized or not recognized. Um, and indigenous peoples either recognize or don't recognize state law, right? So there's diversity among different approaches. And then finally, interlegalities is just the interaction of these various legal systems and the effects that they have uh, on one another. So in these uh, research areas, um, we're, it really is a loose uh, group of people so far. I mean, there's uh, three of us who are co-leading this. It's Jose Alwin from the um, uh, Observatorio Ciudadano in Chile. Um, there is Kristen Anker from the law school here at McGill. And there's me so far co-leading this. And we're really um, hoping to generate interest in more um, people involved. And we already have this great panel this morning where we hope we can build um, some uh, synergies here today. Um, but just to say, so far, uh, what we're doing in terms of indigenous rights, one of the um, um, projects that Jose Alwin, together with Terry Mitchell, who's sitting on the table over there, are looking at is sort of the U United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, um, and uh, particularly extractives um, in Latin America and Canada, and the uptake of uh, the UN Declaration um, by states, but also by indigenous peoples and how they're using it. And I think it's very topical for Canada as it sits in front of the Senate as we have Romeo Saganash's bill that may or may not pass through the Senate this June. Um, so um, I can see sort of an America's discussion on this issue. Um, so that's one of the, the projects that's being worked on right now uh, with regards to indigenous rights. So my own work is um, really centered here on indigenous law, that it's propio. I work with, with communities in Colombia who, um, as all indigenous peoples, are their own lawmakers, their own rules makers, and, um, um, but they find themselves criminalized uh, for the, their own laws and the work that they do with regards to ancestral mining. They're ancestral miners, um, but the state doesn't recognize this um, kind of mining. Um, and so they've really had to uh, push back, develop um, their own laws, and interact with the legal system. And they've actually set some precedent now through the constitutional court system. And they continue exercising their laws and their rights. So I, I'm working with them um, on a variety of different um, processes, but also documenting what's happening and doing undertaking ethnography on these moments of interaction with the state. Um, and they're asserting their own rights even in the context of um, being uh, criminalized uh, for, for doing what they do. Um, and uh, we can see um, this, uh, you know, when we were in uh, the Latin American conference, there's also other examples of where um, indigenous peoples, um, the way they participants put it was, we're not going to wait for state recognition. We are going to assert our own laws anyway. And so there's areas that have been autonomously declared, like the One Piece in, in Peru. There's a Sarayaku um, de Declaration of England stewards. Um, and um, there's other um, examples as well. And in Canada, um, clearly there's also examples that we hope we can pull into this idea or these synergies of looking at indigenous law um, and um, as a starting point uh, for asserting self-determination. And then interlegalities is the third research area. And here, um, it's just, as I was saying before, it's the uh, interconnections between and effects of different legal systems uh, on indigenous laws and how indigenous law also affects those legal systems. And um, right now, there's several um, ideas and works in progress um, that are listed here, ranging from making state law and institutions more responsive to indigenous <coughs> law and institutions to um, the new discussion of around rights to nature or earth jurisprudence and how that interacts with um, indigenous law. Does it uphold it? Does it um, affect it negatively? What's that encounter taking place there? And that's something that Kristen is um, interested in looking at. 
Um, there's a whole question of project law or corporate responsibility and how that interacts with indigenous law or how indigenous law interacts with that. Um, and that's something that Etienne is looking at more closely and we'll be talking about. Um, and then there's other kinds of laws that are pr probably more controversial. In my case, for example, I work in a situation of armed conflict in Colombia, and uh, we don't like to think that armed actors have laws, but the effects of their rules and their sanctions are very much law-like. And so I look at what's happening with the interactions between indigenous law and these armed actors who are very interested in the resources in indigenous lands and, and what's taking place with that interaction as well as other actors. And then finally, also, um, uh, another piece that I'm looking at is um, now in this new post-conflict context in Colombia, um, not post-conflict, post-peace accords, what um, the violence is increasing for indigenous leaders is they assert their rights and exercise their laws. And so the people that I work with are um, strengthening their land stewards, their indigenous guard. And so um, I'm looking at how that's taking place and how it's interacting with the state system, how um, hopefully there'll be recognition for their own guards, their own protection schemes, um, and that they can actually um, be uh, access some of the, the funding that's available um, for um, these kinds of mechanisms. Um, and how uh, this discussion is taking place together with many other indigenous peoples across Colombia, and it could also take place beyond, for example, we're already starting discussions with Peru, indigenous peoples in Peru, and um, um, you know, it, it goes hand in hand with land and land stewardship, but also and uh, monitoring the land, but it um, goes a step beyond because these are people who are also keeping out armed actors from their territories, so it's also about per personal and physical safety and the early warning systems that indigenous guards um, put in place to uh, protect their leaders and their people. So it works on two levels um, and very complex. Um, and then uh, the fourth area that um, this theme is uh, thinking about developing, but we also don't want to create too many expectations because this is a really um, uh, complex thing to get involved with, is to create a rapid response mechanism for indigenous peoples who need access to um, legal support. And so uh, it's a question, and so we're just starting that discussion, you know, is that something that we could provide? Is that something that McGill Law School might be able to um, put in place, for example, with other um, law schools that might be able to support um, indigenous peoples in their struggles, particularly um, against, for example, Canadian mining companies that are affecting them in their lands? Um, and, um, and so, but, but we're also very mindful that maybe that's creating a lot of expectations and we're not sure where to go with that particular piece, because once you get involved with litigation, uh, it can take many years. Um, so these are some of the themes um, that have come up in discussion so far. I finally just wanted to close with um, some of the um, perspectives that were coming out of the Latin American meeting. Um, essentially, uh, we had some very rich discussions and, and, and many uh, small group discussions on um, three questions that we'll be putting up because we were hoping to, to, to duplicate the key questions that we had in, in uh, Bogota, uh, in Fusaga, Suga, and here. Um, but essentially what people were saying was it's all very well and good. We have these rights recognized in the Constitution and we've got these international conventions, but at the end of the day, they're very rarely implemented. And if they are implemented, um, they're misinterpreted and our rights are um, you know, not being up upheld in practice despite being there on the books. And so really at the end of the day, it's up to us and our law and our uh, uh, ways of of uh, working and asserting our rights that um, that um, need to um, need to be at the forefront, um, not you know always in interaction with um, and trying to push for state recognition. But at the end of the day, it's it's what we do ourselves. And um, so there was a real really rich discussion about some of the strategies that indigenous peoples use themselves beyond going to state law or using legal frameworks. So things like. Um, their own um, impact assessments, their own human rights impact assessments, potential projects come to their lands, their life plans, and how important those are in terms of asserting their self-determination. And other tools, um, taking to the street direct action, we heard that yesterday is one of the key pieces um, that Sarah and Gary um, were talking about. And um, So these are some of the strategies that people are coming up with aside from um, you know, just strictly thinking about how do we get recognized through the state system, but other very creative ways of working uh, 
from um, the indigenous out. And so uh, these are just some quotes from uh, some of the it, members of the discussion groups, and I'm not gonna go into that for lack of time, but um, um, these are the key questions that we had, and we're hoping that you'll be able to address in the um, small group discussion. So one is, um, how effective or appropriate are state legal frameworks, national and international, for territorial protection? The second one is, what tools from these frameworks have you used, and with what results? And the third one is, what indigenous law strategies have you used, and with what results? And we thought that those could be three key um, questions for us in the breakout groups later on. So thank you, and I'll hand it over to